Thank you. That's a long one. Um, yeah, so um, my thanks to the organizers of the uh, deep dive session to, uh, um, uh, for giving me the opportunity to give a talk. Um, it was uh, really, in some sense, a last minute decision. I wanted to come um, and attend the whole program uh, run by uh, Sebastian and, and, and the other organizers. Unfortunately, I couldn't for uh, various reasons, and um, but I did make it uh, for this did that session. Very interesting, and um, um, they, they, uh, my talk is not really um, within the main focus uh, of the session, but I will. Uh, you will see that there are overlaps, and uh, hopefully, uh, I can learn from what's been done uh, during the deep dive session to apply to what I'm interested in. Um, so, um, I've been working on the filtering problem for a long, long time. I'm not going to talk about the filtering problem, but I will. Uh, uh, I will start uh, by giving you a few details of the filtering problem to justify what we are doing. Uh, so this will be a sort of a couple of slides related to the filtering problem, and then I will talk about the uh, uh, calibration of a of an SPD. And in in the area of geophysical fluid dynamics, this is this is called stochastic parameterization. And and I will say a little bit about the need for stochastic parameterizations for uh, models that uh, appear in in numerical weather prediction and in um, climate prediction. Um, and then I will give you kind of like the big story, the big uh, picture of how we uh, do this calibration. I'll start with some general principle and then I'll do a very easy um, uh, calibration for, uh, for SPDs with additive noise. Um, this, would, this would be just so that you can, you can see, you can understand what the general principles are. But the case studies that I'll concentrate on will be the uh, stochastic rotating shallow equation. I'll present the equation and explain why this equation is so important and, and sort of it gets so close to uh, the primitive equations and the equations that are actually used to uh, predict the weather. Um, uh, and then uh, some of its pro properties. And then I'll go and explain how we did the stochastic parameterization and the calibration for this particular um, equation and for, uh, for a specific type of noise, which is stochastic aggregation by transport. And then I'll explain. Uh, the numerical experiments, I'll tell you, you know, I'll give you uh, uh, an idea of why this calibration works the way we set it up. And I'll conclude with some final remarks. Now, all of this work, uh, or most of this work has been done uh, as part of a, a, a program, which is called Stochastic Transport in the Upper Ocean Dynamics. If people are interested to um, uh, uh, join the program, to join, to find out what we're doing, um, go to this website, if this is too long, you just type S-T-U-O-D, and then you'll find out uh, a lot of details. We have a very nice website with lots of activities, and I'll try to find time at the end to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and who, you're, who we are. If you want to read more about the, uh, the, what we've done in here, we have one paper out. The first paper is out, um, and it's uh, joined with my two uh, postdocs, one Lang and Alexander Lobe, but also joined work with Peter M. Van Loven and Roland Podhast. And it's, it is on the archive. We submitted it um, some, somewhere. I don't remember where, but we haven't heard from the uh, referees yet. OK, so uh, what is the filtering problem? So uh, you know, I'm, I'm presenting the filtering problem, as I said, not because, not because this is what we're doing now, but because this is what we plan to do. And you will explain why, why we need to do calibration first. Uh, I'm sure mo most of you will already know that this is really uh, very necessary. Um, uh, so what is the filtering problem? Uh, so we, I, I will present this in a discrete framework. I work both in discrete time and uh, in continuous time. Uh, you know, here, I thought it's easier to present uh, uh, the model in discrete time. So we work with uh, a pair of processes, X and Y. X is called the signal process. And this is kind of the hidden component. We, we don't have direct access to uh, the signal process. And I denote uh, X with the subscript um, square bracket zero T, the trajectory of the signal process. And then we have the observation process. That's, that's where the data, this is what you observe. This is what you um, uh, uh, report. 
And again, you have the uh, trajectory of the observation process denoted with a similar notation. And the way in which I visualize this, I like to visualize this. So you, you think of the process X as being, you'll see in a minute, as being a sort of time series, if you want, or a diffusion process in continuous time. And so this, this single process evolves in some uh, state space, the Euclidean state space R dx. And dx is the dimension of the state space. And I'm interested in high dimensional models. And there was a discussion yesterday or what is a high dimensional model. For me, a high dimensional model is something which is larger than a million. And I don't talk about anything uh, less than a million. Ideally, uh, 10 to the power nine, that is what, they, what is required in uh, <laughs> numerical weather prediction. Um, and then associated to this, you have the observation process. And the way in which um, we model the observation process, you'll, you'll see this done on the next page. The observations in this time are a function of the signal plus noise. So this is this uh, models the measurement noise and so on. And so the observational process, again, uh, uh, takes value in some ingredient space, R the Y, the dimension dy is typically a lot smaller than the dimension uh, of the state space. They don't live in the same dimension. So it's, it's very interesting to see if you talk to practitioners, they think that the observations and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, and the signal, they live in the same space. They don't. Uh, typically, the dimension of the observation process is somewhere uh, a few orders of magnitude less, about 10 to the power 6, if it was 10 to the power 9. Uh, for for the whole uh, planetary scale um, general circulation models, um, and they are sparse. And I want to sort of, if you talk, you, well, you can talk at the end, and I can explain what do I mean by sparse observations. But and both, both sparse in time and in space. Um, so uh, I've written here the uh, continuous time equivalent of the observation, but I'm not going to go into that. The way in which I like to visualize this, we want to compute the conditional distribution of the signal given the observations. And what you have in there, so, so this is a, 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 a distribution, a probability distribution that evolves in space. And of course, I cannot uh, uh, write it, uh, do a graphic of that, but the way in which I, I visualize this is by these circles in here, which, is, which are meant to kind of signify kind of the support of the distribution of course, in general, the distribution doesn't have compact support. But anyway, this distribution evolves with this support uh, sitting on the state space. And obviously, the, the, the signal process, the signal process is a point in the support of the distribution. Um, so, you know, that's the picture you should keep in mind in case you haven't done, if you haven't seen the filtering problem before. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the, uh, I don't know why it's cut, but uh, maybe I should... Uh, Let's see. Is it better if I keep it like this? Maybe it's better. Okay, so, so what is the filtering problem? Uh, this is the finding or estimating the conditional distribution of the signal, xt at time t, given the observations, all the observation from time zero up to time t. And I'm writing it explicitly in here. Pi t um, is just the conditional distribution of xt uh, taking value in an infinitesimal uh, ball around little xt given all the observation from time zero up to time t. So that's the filtering distribution. And I'm giving now details about both the signal process and the observation process. And in the easiest, in the most standard uh, framework, xt is assumed to be a Markov chain starting from some probability distribution pi naught, uh, characterized by some uh, kernel, transition kernel kt, and if you want to uh, make things even simpler than that, you just think of XT as being a time series, uh, XT, you know, one dimensional in its case, right? But, you know, we don't work with one dimensional uh, models. XT is a function of XT minus one plus some noise here, which could be normal mean zero variance one modulated by a function of XT minus one. So that's the simplest possible uh, form that the uh, signal can. Uh, have, right? And then the observation, uh, the way in which de you define, describe the observation, uh, you de describe it in terms of its likelihood function GT. But if you want a very simple, you know, if you want a very simple form for the observation, as I already mentioned, you think of the observation being a function of XT plus noise. And noise, the noise can be 
uh, a normal distribution mean zero minus one. Um, so the way in which you evolve pi t, I've written it in here, right? You, uh, you know, most of you might have seen it already. So to go from pi t minus one to pi t. So remember, this is the trans transfer of distribution, uh, an evolution of a probability distribution. Uh, first of all, you uh, push it forward the court using the transition kernel, right? And you end up with another probability distribution, uh, pt. And you know, this has many different names depending on the area where you work. Uh, in you know, it's called the forecast in data simulation or the prediction step. It's a linear, it's definitely a linear step, a linear transformation. And then we have a nonlinear transformation uh, where you multiply this pt by by the likelihood function and then you normalize, and then this is how you obtain pi t. And again, this is the update steps or the analysis steps or the assimilation steps, depending on where you work. So you do this filtering problem starting from some nominal value zero. Right, and so filtering problem is done from zero to t, and you can do this sequentially. And of course, you cannot compute by t explicitly, so you have to do you have to do some approximations. And you know, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of particle filters, but that's beside the story here because that's not what I will talk about. What I will talk about is what happens before time zero, right? So before time zero, you know, even though you have this you have this model here. You can assume that you have a format for the model. You have to calibrate the model, okay? And in, in this talk, I will only concentrate on calibrating, on, on estimating sigma, on finding some sigma. B is gonna be supposed to, is gonna be known. And I'll come back and explain why in geophysical fluid dynamics this, this B is known. It's known because it comes from physical principles from you know all, all the, um, the, the modeling that has been already been done. So we don't touch B. All we need to know, all we need to estimate is, uh, is sigma. And so this is where, you know, we begin to see some connections with uh, the topic of this deep dive because essentially here we're going to assume that we have samples from the signal, right? We actually have samples from the signal. From here onwards, we will no longer have samples from the signal. And of course, you can ask how, how, how come you had samples from the signal before time zero and you no longer have samples from the signal after time zero. I will explain that too. Um, but you have to assume that you have samples from the signal because you're going to use these samples from the signal in order to calibrate sigma. And sigma here, you know, I'm saying here, I'm, I'm saying here this is, a, this is a function of the state, right? But sigma here in the models that we look at will be, you know, very high dimensional. It's going to be a matrix which for example, it could be a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. So you want to, you want to find, you find it, you want to find this sigma. And that's, this is what we call stochastic parametrization. Stochastic parametrization simply means uh, adding a sigma to this, uh, to a deterministic model. Any questions so far? Okay, so let me go on. Um, so I, I have a couple of slides with that, which I put there and I, it's probably not, relevant to this audience, but I put these slides there because uh, this is, these are based on the current opinion in uh, and medical weather prediction and in data simulation um, uh, and in climate modeling where you know, they, they do come, they do say that it's, it's good to have stochastic models, which is a great thing for us, right? You know, up until 10, 15 years ago, people were very reluctant to work with stochastic models. Everything was deterministic, even though, when they were doing the uh, updates, the, the data simulations, they were using wave variance of the Kalman filter. So for the Kalman filters, as we, we all know, basically the Kalman filters is, is based on a linear model, linear model where the signal itself is stochastic, but they were applying these things to the misting models. So it's very, uh, um, they were, the, the, this very, uh, the, the area is still uh, dominated by ad hoc uh, models. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's very little in terms of rigorous modeling a rigorous methodology developed uh, in numerical order prediction. However, it works, right? So the, despite, despite you know, uh, uh, theoreticians mourning when what you're doing, it doesn't make sense, it works. It's, it's, it, goes, it, gets, it gets very uh, close to neural networks. You know, we, we, it, it, it seems to be working fine. And you know, we, we all depend on, on, on the weather, on the uh, uh, forecast. 
you know, we woke up this morning and he checked. Yes, it was raining, so I got my jacket out. Uh, it, you know, everything that 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 they do, you know, influences our life on a day-to-day basis uh, uh, substantially. So, you know, the fact that you know we it, it works is really, uh, you know, we have to really pay attention to what they do. Um, right. So, <clears throat> the way in which they do this thing is, you know, they they have uh, con- continuous equation of, of motion. That means what? That means that you know, before that, the physicists came and they say, well, look, the atmosphere and the ocean, they evolve according to this. There's this influence of uh, the Earth's gravitational field, the uh, gravity, uh, the uh, rotation. Uh, you know, all of these are put together, right? Uh, and they together form something which is called the general circulation model, which is based mathematically on an equation called the primitive equation. So this primitive equation basically tells you you know, grosso modo, what happens to the evolution of the system, right? So this primitive equation is this beam here. So, you know, it was, it's going to give you the deterministic part of the evolution of the signal. That's why I'm saying B you don't touch because B is, div- is given to you, okay? So the way in which this primitive equation is used, you, you take it, they have a grid, they have a massive, massive grid, right? They, they, they slice the ocean of the atmosphere into eight layers, and each of these layers, each of these layers is again discretized, and they have this massive, massive grid where the primitive equation is computing. So they have a huge algorithm uh, that computes, approximates the primitive equation on this grid. Okay, so this is done. They have supercomputers to do that. Uh, <clears throat> and it works. Now, even though there are, it is a lot of evidence to show that this, the, uh, a forecast based on this is good, they realize that there are, there's lots of shortcoming. Why, is it, why there are problems with this? There are problems with this because they cannot capture what happens in between consecutive grid points, right? So the, diff- the distance between two consecutive grid, grid points can be as big as eight kilometers, right? For, for general separation model, for, for, for uh, regional models, it, it, go, it goes to under a kilometer. So anything that happens under a kilometer, Cannot be captured by by what by by what happens on 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 the on the big grid, right? So in order to cope with that, they add perturbation. So most of the time, up until kind of like ten years ago, this perturbation was added in a deterministic fashion, right? And it was only in the last ten years that people started to say, okay, look, we have to add stochastic perturbation. They are better. Uh, designed to account for this unresolved scale. So by unresolved scale, uh, this means this exactly means you know what what happens in between between two uh, grid points. And you know you, you get, so so for example, you know for for weather, the, one of the most difficult things to uh, predict is 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 rain, exactly because exactly because the rain depends uh, in a in a uh, very much by what happens of the subscale. What happens in between different points? You know, it could be, it could be that you know they could tell you, well, there's going to be a rain, you know, in South England, but they cannot tell you precisely whether it's going to be raining, you know, above the Isaac Newton Institute. So you know, it goes, it goes like that. So, so there's there's been papers like that, and you know, I, I'm giving here a paper which uh, was published by the American Meteorological Society, uh, uh, which was which had. In excess of 30 authors, and you know, a, a lot of these guys are really famous uh, in in this area, where you know the the uh, the general conclusion of the paper is that it's good to have stochasticity, which is great for us, right? And so they say here, stochastic parameterizations empirically derived or based on rigorous mathematical and statistical concepts have great potential to increase the predictive capability of the next generation weather and climate models. So and it's really very, very important. And you know, this is exactly the right time to come in and study stochastic models as applied to um, geophysical fluid dynamics. Okay, so that's what I wanted to uh, say related to stochastic parameterization. So now let me let me go and try to explain, you know, very abstractly what is a geophysical uh, 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 fluid dynamics model. Um, so this is should be a model. So I'm, I'm writing I'm writing it here in in a very abstract way, right? But I'll give you some example in a minute. So so think of it 
that you, you have a PD, right? You have a PD and um, you run this PD on this fine scale. So M with the subscript F, superscript F means that you run the PD on the fine scale. And since a PD in the, there's an operator here, A, polygraph K, which varies depending on what your choice of the PD is going to be. Okay, and so the, and the point is what we want to do, we want to work with a variant of the PD on the core scale. So you're not gonna work on the, with the PD on the, on the, uh, on the high uh, uh, scale, high resolution uh, uh, model. We want to work with the PD on the core scale. Why is that? That's because you want to save computational uh, uh, effort, right? And also because we might not need all the details of the high dimensional PD to do what we want to do, to do the filtering, uh, to do the filtering uh, uh, problem. So rather than working with this PD on the, on the refined grid, we're gonna work, we would like to work with an SPD, right? Where you add to the deterministic part a stochastic bit, right? And I will, so there's another operator here, M, and this is gonna be driven by a cylindrical Brownian motion, right? And the point is that this addition here, right? Is meant to account for the Anison scale, is meant to account to, for, you know, what happens in between two consecutive uh, uh, grid points, okay? And so it's part of our ansatz that we have to choose M, right? So everything will depend on the particular choice of M. So you have to be very careful how you choose M, but once you choose M, then you have to calibrate the noise, right? So let me just explain. It's a, it's a really reasonable to assume that it's browsing. No. No, so that's the next step. You know, this is uh, Star Trek, the next generation. You know, we begin to say, okay, but you know, we started with uh, brown emotion, but now we are smarter than that. We have to uh, uh, work with fractional brown emotion. We have to work with rough paths and so on. So this is, you know, this is we we're so already working already again so scale separation. Yeah, yeah. Lines, yeah. So we have, right? we we we're already working on the next uh, generation uh, where we say, well, okay. You know, we, we can assume that this is a cylindrical Brownian motion, and we're going to talk about how you calibrate using this ansatz. But as far as the theoretical part is concerned, so of course, we very quickly looked at not so, you know, we have papers that looked at this type of SPDs and showed the word closeness for those type of SPDs driven by Brownian motion. But then this was replaced by a rough pass, and we have looked at a rough path version of this. In particular, if you have a fractional brown emotion, if you have memory, you have correlation, you know, you can ask the same questions there. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not giving you what I'm working on. I'm giving you what I finished working on. No, it's not all stuff. It's not, you know, it's still, it has just, you know, we, we submitted it uh, uh, two months ago. Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, as I said, the, the, the stochasticity here is driven by this cylindrical brown emotion. And so, so, you know, in the most, you know, purely mathematical theoretical way, I'm assuming that we have an infinite set of noises, right? So you have, you know, an infinite set of brown emotions, right? Of course, in practice, we will not have that. We will have to stop somewhere. We'll have a finite set of brown emotions, but we have to decide, decide how many sources of noise we're gonna have. And this size here, these size here are not constants. These are vector fields. These are space dependent vector fields, right? So in the examples that you'll see, you know, each of these size, the dimension of this, each of the size is going to be uh, the dimension of the grid, however many points are there. So we want, what we want to do, we want to get some size. How many size, again, you have to find out how many size you need. Right, so they, so this is not parameter. You cannot think of this as parameter estimation because the dimension of the variables that we want to estimate is humongous. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the example that I'm gonna show you in a minute, you know, this is, is you know, you, we estimated the size on, on the course grid that has 4,000 points. So each of these size would have to have 4,000 dimensions. And in that case, we had to have 128 Brownian motions. Right, so each of these had to be estimated. So this is, I'm trying to emphasize that, you know, you cannot think of this as parameter estimation where you have, where you, have to, you estimate one side precisely, 
one dimension side precisely, right? Or maybe 10. And we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of things that needs to be estimated. Okay, so, so the, the object here is to estimate the size in here, and it's based on the choice of the actual operator that you put in there. Um, so here's a single example. This is not the example, the, the case study that I will present, but this is the simplest example where you know I can make things a bit more understandable. So, you know, this is we 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 this is the 2D Euler equation in vorticity form. Vorticity is a measure of the fluid that looks at how quickly the, the fluid uh, rotates around itself. Okay, so just look at it like this. I, I wrote I wrote here the form of the operator, not an easy form, but is there. You can explicitly see what it is. Uh, essentially, the vorticity is affected according to the uh, 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 velocity of the fluid, and that's the equation for it. <clears throat> now, what kind of M are we talking about? So, so I need to explain what what this M should be, right? So, so we you could you could have just additive noise, right? You can just have add uh, uh, a cylindrical Brownian motion to it, right? So this is going to look like this, and this circ here simply means that well, in this case it doesn't make any difference, but later on it's just, you're just doing Stratonovich integration, right? And so, um, it, you know, it makes it very little difference whether from the point of view of, uh, of calibration, whether you have Stratonovich or Ito uh, integrals, but, you know, it makes dif a difference when you go and run the model. So you can have additive noise, you can have multiplicative noise, or you can have transport noise. So these are, these are three different ways in which you can account for the missing scales, right? So this has to be decided by you. This is this has to be your ansatz before you begin to do your uh, before you begin to do um, your calibration. And so what I want to do, I want to show you here. I want to show you. So this is uh, simulations of the two D Euler. On the top bit, you'll see the evolution. Of the 2D were on the fine grid. Um, the fine grid was 512 by 512. On the bottom one, what you do, you take the top one, you project it on the bottom one, and you run the bot run, run the bottom one on the on the on the course grid. Okay. And so at the moment, this is the starting point. There is no difference between the two, right? Except that the bottom one is modified, right? Because you know you miss out on the details that that are there because because of a much more refined grid. So the point. So what I'm going to run it now, and what you need to see in here is that you know very quickly, very quickly, the two simulations, the two simulations start to diverge from one another. Why is that? That that's because on the on the bottom one, I miss I miss what happens in between consecutive grid points. Right, so the the fact that I, I I have unresolved scale is really very important, right? It's not the system is because the system is not linear, right? This you know they diverge very quickly. So I'm going to just show it to you. Okay, so on on this side is the evolution of the uh, vorticity, right? So let me just stop it a bit. So that means what? So if it's white, it means that there is no vorticity. The fluid is not does not rotate around itself. If it's, uh, if it's brown, it rotates clockwise. If it's uh, blue, it rotates counterclockwise. The actual uh, uh, velocity is in here. So in here, the color tells you <clears throat> how, you know, what is the velocity, what is the uh, uh, absolute value of the velocity. And I'm not sure if you see, there's, there's some arrows here. Our postdoc did some arrows to show the direction of the velocity. So the bigger the arrow, the faster the velocity. So that's how it evolves, right? So this is kind of, I just, you just, um, it, it, it just meant to see that, you know, very quickly, the two differ massively, you know, all the vortices are in the wrong place and so on. So the fact that you have to account for the energy of scale, uh, uh, scales is really essential, right? Because otherwise, you know, you cannot just use the course you cannot just use the course uh, PD and hope that you know you're going to be fine. You're going to still be close uh, to the uh, refined scale dynamics. Okay, so 
Um, so what you, what I showed you was, uh, you know, the top one was on 530 by 512. The, the bottom one was 64 by 64. And we gain more, we gain computational effort, not just because the, the grid is coarser and you, you solve your equations on a coarser grid, but also you don't have to have so refined time steps because of the CFL condition for the high resolution model, you have to have these time steps and you know they can be a hundred times coarser on, on, on the coarser grid. Okay, so yeah. You will show the same thing with 4,000 versus 512 or something, will it make the same difference? Yes, so yes. Basically this problem you, has infinite information. Exactly, exactly. You know, so, so I'm gonna come back here. Let me come back here. So, so there's a huge part of the community, the, the numerical weather prediction community that say, the solution is we have to go with more refined, more refined grids. We're gonna get more refined grids, we're gonna get better and better and better. No, it's there's always you hit the same problem. There's always things that you miss out that no matter how small the uh, grid is gonna be, eventually you, 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 you have the same problem, right? So this is like a fractal, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, you put more stuff in, you lose more stuff. You know, so it's not like, it's not like, like you're, you know, you, you you get to a saturation value where you say, okay, if your uh, if your grid is this refined, you're going to be fine. You're not going to miss anything. That's not true. That's not true. There's lots of things that appear out of nowhere, right? The minute you, say, you get more refinement of the grid. Could one have some kind of decay of this error? Or... Uh, this, I don't know. I think this talk about this is turbulence. It's other thing is related to turbulence, right? So, you know, turbulence is still not understood. Right. Okay. So I want to present the general principles of this calibration. So remember, I want to compute those size, those size. I want to estimate those size, or or if you think of sort of the first model, I want to estimate sigma. The, I want to calibrate the noise of my equation. So the way I do this, the first thing you do, you say you, you have to start some with some data. And the data that you start with is your data on the defined grid. Okay, so the point I'm going to make later on is that I'm not going to care where the data comes from. No. So for, for what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you synthetic data in the sense that I'm going to run the data, I'm going to run the PD on the defined grid, right? But you can data, you can get data from various websites that will give you data for various parts of the oceans. And I'm going to... I mean, you can say what, what this just said is true, that basically by defining, you don't really solve the problem. No, you don't solve the problem. But then you calibrate your model to a high resolution model, which itself, according to your statement, is actually wrong. Yes. So then you're calibrating it to the wrong model. Yes. So what is the so, problem there? So what I need, I need this, a starting point. I need the starting, so it, it's going to come back, come up, but it, I need a starting point for the subspace where the noise is going to go into so even though the model might be wrong what i need to know is you know where is i i need to i, I i'm calib i'm looking at the unresolved scares in here and I, i'm not looking at the model itself and i'm going to come back to this and i'm I really going to make i make this point again and again that this is really it, this comes back in different guises that it's okay for the model to be wrong. It's okay to have errors as long as the errors are not that big, infinitesimal. And you'll see what I mean. You'll see why this is very important. It's a very good question. Okay. So so I want to show you, I want to show you here. So this is data coming from uh, the iframer, our collaborators, right? So this is they have data, right? You know, you, you choose your year down here. You choose your month, you choose your day, and then you can find out data. This data is temperature, it's ocean temperature. So you can get data directly from them. They'll give you the data, here's the data, do whatever you want to. So there's lots of things you can, data is available to you, right, at, uh, for the whole thing. So of course, what is this data? So this is real data, right? So, but what is this actually data? Well, so this is data which has been collected from satellites, put together, Right and interpolate it between the various satellites. So that's what we mean by real data, right? And you could use this to calibrate your 
model. You see, so this is real data that is available. And you yeah, can, this is one of the columns that, that the data doesn't have the residues in the EEG to parameterize the fine scales. Oh, no, this one, this one will have. I mean, you know, this one will have. This one will have. No. Because, because what they do, you know, they just put uh, assign uh, values to every point on the, on, on the grid, right? That, that's, this is, we have to work with this. It, it, there is nothing better than that. I know, but I mean, isn't that the thing that Bertrand, for example, told us last year, that they now have this new satellite system where they can actually yeah. measure sort of vortices yeah. in the ocean to much higher resolution, yeah. where they're actually going to see turbulence at the scale uh, they haven't been able to observe so yeah. far, right? So, so it's going to be a, a game changer. So now you actually have the data on these fine scales. I okay, mean, so, so the final scale. So this is this is what what he, he, yes, he has got yeah. he has got the inside knowledge here because he is the he he is, he is the uh, uh, the chair of our uh, uh, advisory board. So what what I'm showing you here, so this is the the data that will arrive that is is about to arise. It's one of the first uh, sets of data that has been made available. So this is a new set of satellite satellites where you know what, what what you see here is data that is collected from the satellite this is sort of this very fine accuracy data right so the satellite comes and makes a record of this bit and then after 90 minutes it's coming come, comes again and met, makes a record of the next bit after 90 minutes comes again, makes a record of the next bit and so on so for this bit in here yes you're fine everything in between there's nothing so you still have to do some jiggery popery there. So even if with the arrival of this new and amazing set of data, there's still going to be large parts of the ocean where at every any one time there is no data. So you have to what do you do? You know, if you want to work with your data, what they do, they come and use some sort of linear interpolation, you know, to get, you know, to get some data so that we can have a way to start with and calibrate the model. So there is never going to be a situation where we say, I have observational data for the entire of the ocean at any one time. Never. Right? So we have to live with that. You know, so that, that's the way it's going to be forever and ever. <laughs> so, but, okay. Let me, uh, let me go back. <clears throat> so, we assume that we got some data from somewhere, and for, for what I'm going to show you, it's going to be synthetic data we're just going to uh, solve the rotating shallow model on, on a fine grade. And then the next thing we do, we're going to coarsen the data. You know, so we, we, we apply a methodology, we modify the data uh, so that you know, we, we get its corresponding values on the coarse grid. Right? So, this is, so I'm not saying that I'm running the PD on the coarse grid. I take the PD from the fine grid and coarsen it, modify it, using a low pass filter to get it on the core street. Okay. And then I take the difference between these two values. The difference between these two values, I want to, I'm making the answers that this will capture, this will, this will capture the unresolved scales. This will, this will capture what I'm missing. So I'm taking the difference between the actual data and its coarsening, its modification. And so I get, I get a, a process M, right? And the point in here, the point of this process is that should I take increments, small increments of this process, small increments of the process will look like this, will look like the actual stochastic term that I add in my PDE, to my PDE. The data will look like this, okay? So why is this a savior? But this is a savior, is, it, this is a savior because the next step will, will be to say, Okay, you know, I cannot work with the stochastic integral, so I'm going to work with the discretization of the stochastic integral, and the discretization of the stochastic integral will be just a sum up to some capital N, and I have to define what, uh, find out what this capital N is going to be, of, you know, my operator applied to the modification, and then here I get the size that I want to estimate and the increments of Lebronian motion. Okay, now. You can see here that something happening here that somehow the, the, the drift has disappeared in there and it has disappeared in there because this is the, the this is the higher order term the other term is a smaller order 
right? So if I make a, an error in this in the other term, as long as it's a order dt, this is a order, this is a order square root of dt, it's fine. I'm not gonna see it. I'm not gonna see it. So I'm okay to work with wrong models as long as infinitesimally these wrong models do not affect, are not a border square root of delta t. Right. But local errors are not equal to global errors. So, In time, you mean? Yeah. No, but so, so my data now is just gonna be infinitesimal data. So I'm gonna pick up infinitesimal data, right? On a grid, which is sufficiently dispersed so that they are not correlated, right? So this is, this is now my data. My data will be time infinitesimal time increments of the difference between the refined, the refined simulation and this coarsening. Okay, so that is my data. So I look to things like this, and out of these samples, I'm beginning to talk about samples, out of these samples, I want to extract the size. And in order to extract the size, I apply a principal component analysis to find out how many sizes I need, in other words, n, and to estimate this size themselves. So these are, the, these are essentially the general principles of, of the calibration. And when I'm gonna go and solve the PD and SPD, they can be solved on the same scale. They can be solved theoretically on the same scale. So when I do the mathematics, I can prove your well poisonous on, on the torus and so on. But when I do the numerics, the PD is solved on the fine scale, the SPD is solved on the core scale. That means that I can solve the SPD a lot faster than the PD is uh, solved. And so this is what I'm saying in here, that we can use input data, data from satellite observations, uh, you know, and I, I talked a little bit about this, or synthetic data, but you need to have a sufficiently large time window zero, uh, zero T. <clears throat> now the thing, yeah. Uh, do you know if it's psi k now or have one, or do you use the eigenvalues from the PCA to? Yeah, so the PCA is going to give you both the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues, the eigenvectors have, we're going to have, the eigenvectors have norm one, we have to multiply by square root of the eigenvalues so that, you know, they have the right, uh, uh, the right scale. Okay, and this is the scale This is the scale thing. Yeah, yeah, this is the scale thing. <clears throat> okay, so so the, the thing that you have to choose, this is your choice in here. So, you know, this is still uh, not independent of your choices. You have to choose M here. Could be additive, multiplicative, transport noise. And what I'm going to show you here is a, a speci specific kind of uh, noise, which is called salt noise. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about that if there is time. Okay, so so again, I'm going, I'm now going back to the additive noise thing because this is the easiest to explain. And because in here, we just apply the PCA to exactly the increment. So, so you know, uh, this is when I'm, I'm choosing, I'm choosing one, M is just constant equal to one. I get the increments of these differences, right? Divided by square root of delta T. And if I do that, then, you know, this, Roughly, there's an error there, but I'm going to ignore that error because you can prove that that error is a scope of order delta t, not, and this is a order square root of delta t. And now this thing here, I'm pretend, and this thing here is going to be a sample from a normal with mean zero and covariance matrix given by, given by this, right? So you have to take psi, psi transpose and sum them up. Okay. And the point is now, I have the samples and I'm using PCA to compute the size. Now it may be, it may be that I can use generative models in order to sort of do something smarter with these samples. Because at this point, these samples now are just samples from a very high, high dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution, very high dimensional, 4,000, 10,000 uh, dimensions, okay? Uh, but, you know, I'm just telling you what we've done. Okay, so, so, these are the data samples for this additive noise, and uh, they have to be drawn independently, which means that you know there's you know you have to find out the decorrelation times. So there's work to be done to find out what the decorrelation time, and then you apply the PCA to find out how many size you need and the size themselves. The point I need to make here is that this this size 
they depend on the data. You change the data, you change the size. You change the points where you do the samples, you change the size, right? So, so this is not like in parameter estimation. I go back to that. The parameter estimation, you expect to have a single size, a single size. You know, you, you go and try to get to a single size. This characterizes the distribution of, you know, uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the perturbation, not the actual. So you know, you can have different size giving you different approximations of the same distribution. So what was the estimated before they defined for the shadow water model, for example? Relative to the I have the numbers. I'll show you the numbers. I'll show you the numbers. So okay, now I'm going to so this is I'm going to go for real for this uh, rotating shallow model. And you know, I'm, I'm showing it to here and I'll give you the details on the next page. That, that this is a model that has two variables. One is the velocity of the, the, the fluid, and the other one is the height of the fluid. And it's called shallow because because the horizontal directions are meant to be much bigger than, than the vertical direction, than, than H, than H itself. And H itself is measured, you know, you can see what H is here, is a measure from the surface of the fluid to the bottom of the ocean or to the bottom of the fluid, right? And this is something that the satellites can measure quite accurately, right? Because, you know, the bottom, of, the bottom is already mapped out. You know, I can show you, you know, this one knows where is the bottom of the ocean for every point uh, on in the ocean and the surface, you know, the satellites will get you there where the surface is. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to compute this H, but there are lots of other ways in which you can get to this H. I'm not gonna go into details for that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is the model. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm sort of, I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna say a few things. So the, the model, the U has two dimensions, right? Uh, horizontal that uh, 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 sort of x and y direction. Okay, height is the, the fluid of the column and of water, and then you have two other influence. One, um, one is to, is the Coriolis force takes into account the the, the Earth rotates around itself, and the other one is the uh, gravitational uh, force. Right? So so this takes into account these two additional things. It's it's much more complicated than the Euler equation that I've just shown you before. And you know you can you can write it in some simple form so so that it looks like the equation that I've shown you before with the calligraphic k. But of course, uh, this f looks much more complicated than the Euler equation. So there's a page here. I have a couple of pages here which it's, they explain why is it that this is a good equation to simulate. It comes very close to the three D primitive equations, and these are the equations that are normally generally used for numerical weather prediction. And it has a uh, it has lots of Physical properties uh, that are quite good, and I'm not going to go into this. You know, how it satisfies Hamilton principle, separation, and so on. <clears throat> now, what I want to do, I want to add stochasticity to this, and I could add stochasticity the way I showed you, make it additive, multiplicative, and transport, and, and so on. But my colleague at Imperial, who Dario Form, who you know, has a physics background, came up with a new way of adding stochasticity. Mm -hmm which preserves a lot of the physical properties of the deterministic model. And so the way he came about with this, he said, well, okay, so let's not perturb the PD itself, right? Let's perturb, let's look, look uh, infinitesimal and what happens to a particle of fluid and let's perturb that one. And then you perturb that one, you add stochasticity to that particle of fluid, and then you say, okay, now let's go back and see what happens, what sort of SPD you end up with, right? So, so there's, there's two ways to look at fluids. There's the Lagrangian way, which, which you sort of, the reference system is the particle of fluid and you try to follow the particle of fluid. And it's the Eulerian when we just look from above and you look at the whole, the whole fluid as a whole and see how, how, it, how it evolves. So rather than looking at the Eulerian part, we look at it from above and say, well, let's just add some toxicity to the PDE. He, he had the idea to say, well, let's just perturb the particle of fluid so that preserve the circulations and all these things, you know, Hamilton principle and so on. Lots of things can be obtained by looking at the Lagrangian perspective rather than where I was taking. Okay, so he did that. And this was the result. And the result is, fun, you know, amazingly completely different from additive noise, multiplicative noise, transport noise, is, is this thing here. I'm not going to go through the details. I'm just going to say that you know once you begin to, to think rigorously to develop 
uh, stochastic parameterization from rigorous mathematical principles, you don't get some of the standard ones that everybody is using. You know? So, you know, this is what it is, something which is very complicated, which we looked at, we analyzed, we, you know, and we proved that the equation is well posed. Okay. So now, now, now that we have an equation, we have this ansatz to get to, to, to use this stochastic parameterization, we have the end, we have to start to calibrate it. Okay. So, yeah. So, um... In my mind, you're already talking about it. So, what do you mean? So, we, we model the, the actual particle and we use some sort of a statistical mechanics uh, mechanism to, to, re to reverse it out to get a lower expression of the SPD. Is that correct? Um, okay, so, so, uh, so what I mean, particle of fluid, right? So, this yeah. is not. This is not like a McKean Blasov uh, thing. It's not McKean Blasov. Nothing to do with McKean Blasov. You know, so so it's 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 just a physical interpretation. You know what what happens to each particle of fluid, but it's not. You shouldn't think of it as a McKean class of uh, uh, characterization. You know, you get, you know, you 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 get the evolution of the uh, uh, of the velocity by uh, by doing the mean field interaction. It's not that. Okay. Okay. So. Here we are. So, so when we run the simulation, we run the simulation. The fine grid was this big, two thousand by two hundred twenty. So it's it's a very elongated grid, right? And the idea here we want to look go around the the, the Earth uh, with with this grid, uh, which were these were the physical dimensions. We have an initial condition, uh, <coughs> um, and we had the burning period from this initial condition, and this was what delta t was 20, 22 point five seconds. What was your question earlier? You asked me a question. I said it's going to come up. Uh, the decomposition time. Okay. Okay. So it's coming up. Okay. So <laughs> essentially, as I said, we have three terms: elevation, velocity in the horizontal, in in the east-west direction, and north-south direction. Um, and then here, I'm explaining the same thing. You know how you go through all of the steps. I'm not going to go through this. Um, the difference here is that because it's it, because the uh, m the the uh, the uh, uh, operator that appears in the stochastic uh, in the in the stochastic parametrization is a lot more complicated, we cannot just directly apply PCA. So you know I'm writing here the increments. Now these increments, what will appear in here, it's an it's an operator. You end, you end up with a differential operator, which differentiates. The cylindrical Brownian motion. So what you need to do, you write everything in terms of a hyperbolic equation. You have to solve that hyperbolic equation so that eventually you get to your data. So to get to the data here is much more complicated than before. You have to solve every time you have one one one, one of those increments. You have to solve the hyperbolic equation to get the data. But once you've done this, again you can apply the PCA to uh, to get uh, to get the uh, the data. Okay, so um, this this explains what the low pass filter is, and this is this explains what the correlation is. So um, this is the lag. This is the decorrelation time. Twenty five uh, steps, twenty five SPD steps, and then so we end up with thirty three data samples. So they have to be quite rare, right? So there is correlation. There is correlation. So. To your question, then why do you, why do you have Brownian motion? This is the first step. We start with Brownian motion, then we can make things a lot more complicated. So, <clears> so what is the, the, the of what, okay? So 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 the, the, the point is the point is in, in you know let me go back to here. So this these increments here, these increments here, right? You know, on paper, on paper should be increments. You know, I take the increments of run and motion, multiply by something, approximately, right? But they're not perfect, right? On, <clears throat> you know, they, they will there will be correlation between them because of all the errors that come in between, right? But you know, there's methodology which says if I look at these increments and I keep them farther and farther apart. You know, eventually, 
eventually, if you compute the correlation between them, the correlation is going to be very small, acceptably small. And then I'm going to pretend, okay, they are independent. So that's the so way. Statistic theory is assuming that it independent. Yeah. If you're not independent, you get a bias in the estimate. That they will throw you off. I think the subsampling is one of the ideas. Where... Yeah. We do some, we, we, take, we take the sum out, right? We centralize them, but that doesn't solve no, 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 no. the big correlation problem. That's why, that's why you, know, you have to have a time timeline sufficiently far so that you have enough, enough of these samples that are all decorrelated. Of course. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to go to the next step. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the results. So the results, there's, there's, there's eight sets of results. Um, so uh, we have two sets of grids, one which is more refined than the other. So remember, we start from 2000, we go to 500 by 80 and 256 by 40. You know, this is the most important bit. This introduces the most amount of stochasticity, right? Now for each of these grids, for each of these grids, we look at explaining 90% of the violence or 99% of the violence. So they, they, you know, we want to put as many, uh, as, as many uh, sources of noise, as many brown emotion, so that you can't, you, you account for 90% of the violence. You go within 90% of the actual provenance matrix or 99%. So again, you know, of course, there will be more violence, there will be more noise if you want to explain 99% of the violence. And then I'm going to show you each one of them will, will, will have simulations of the SPD now, right, with the calibrated size. Corresponding, you, you can have 50 simulations or 100 simulations. And you'll see that this counts for the, the least inference. In other words, in other words, the stochasticity is, is there already. So what I'm showing you now is this is the first set of sites. You, you need me to stop. Okay. Okay. So I, I should stop, right? Oh, you want a minute. Okay, then. So how many minutes do I have? One minute. Okay, then. So, so this size, so this is, this is the sign. The first site, the one that that it's the first when you do the PCA is is the it takes most of the binary salt, right? And this is site number nine. So in this particular case, we needed nine sets of Brownian motions. We needed nine sites for that, and there's one virus of site, one site for in the in the uh, horizontal direction and one site in the vertical direction. And you can see that this one, this one. Uh, is coarser than this one. So as you go along and get more and more size, they 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 are more detailed, as it were. They are more detailed. Okay. So these are now the simulations. So this is you now the proof of the pudding is here. That's all you need to see. So the red thing in here is the truth. So you solve the PD on the refined scale. You choose one point on the refined scale projected down to the core scale. And this is what happened. This is the value. This is the value of the height. This is the value of the horizontal velocity, uh, east west uh, horizontal velocity, and this is north south horizontal velocity at that point. And when you, what you see in here, you see this is the evolution of the SPD around the coarse grid. And the point in, is that you need to see you know, the, that they follow each other. They're not going to be close to each other, right? Because there's randomness, right? but they kind of follow each other, right? And this is exactly what happens. Things are not perfect. You know, things are not perfect, but that's okay. That's, that's acceptable. That's acceptable, right? Because you see, eventually they, it goes back in and they just follow each other. Okay. So this explains the ensemble spread. Yeah. So you guys were like the feedback of the SPD now or, or the confidence? No, no. So, so these are the confidence intervals. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, sort of. You know, plus or minus 25 percent, you know, up to the whole thing. And if you would run one sample without any noise, how would that work? Would it completely diverge or would it also stay in the confidence interval? I mean, I mean th this is the truth. And yeah, but in the, 
So the boots are not solved on the cross grid, right? Yes. And if you would start just on the cross grid and solve without the white noise addition? But then, then sort of eventually this is going to go away. As I showed you with the picture, it goes away from. Uh, Maybe what's the price of the most of it is such a lot of growth with time. Oh, this they grow. They do. Okay. This is just a short time interval, right? So why why did I choose this short time interval? Because I already have in mind that I'm going to do filtering, right? So I only need to know what happens in between two consecutive times when I'm doing the filtering, right? I don't need to have a long time uh, uh, description of this, right? It's going to go eventually, but for the purpose of filtering, this is the kind of time interval that I work with. Because remember, once I, once I calibrated this, then I say, okay, now I can start doing my filtering. That means that I can start doing forecasts and so on. Up until now, I just prepared the model. But, but, but then again, I guess that was your question as well. I mean, if you want to plug the trajectory of a model, the course model without the noise, that would also be basically fairly close over that short period. Well, not always, not always. Not, not always, they, you know, they just differ. They, they will differ, yeah, different. They, they will differ. But you know, for the filtering, you know, I need to have spread. You know, my, my particle filters do not work if I don't have stochasticity in there to this. All the particles that, you know, the, 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 filter, the, the particle filter will generate instantaneously if the particles do not spread. You know, just essentially just- So it's about the confidence in the walls so you sort of- yeah, so you can have the confidence interval, you can look at those, and it has to be sufficiently uniform. How would it compare to just estimating the variance at the last time step and just adding observational variance of the magnitude of something? Wait, 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 wait. That's a different story. That's a different story because we were talking now just about the signal. We don't yet have. Uh, I mean, I, I can give another talk in that and I can show you what the observation. So the observation variance is really huge, right? You know, I can show you, you know, I can, I can show you afterwards, you know, the observational variance is huge compared with this. Yeah. All right, I guess that for, I guess we should stop. Because okay, we stop. stop. So, yeah, yeah. so ensemble spread, this is what it is. <clears throat> you can see them paired up uh, in the sense of they have more, a lot more stochasticity when you, when you uh, coarsen the scale, coarsen the grid more compared with when you coarsen the grid less. And then, you know, if you explain more of the variance, you have more stochasticity. And we did the RMSC, the L2Error CC. Look at the L2Error, it is increasing to be expected, be expected. And then, you know, some final remarks, I'm gonna jump over this. I just wanna say a couple of minutes uh, from, uh, uh, from the funders, so we you know we we have this uh, huge uh, program that's been running since 2020. Uh, the PIs are Bertrand Chapron from IFMR, myself and Dai Huang from Imperial, Etienne Mevin from Iria. Um, what we want to do, we have a huge research plan that starts from the very beginning, from models, develop models, prove that the models were were posed, develop uh, numerical methods, and do the data data analysis data simulations with using real data. If you are interested to, uh, uh, to take part in the program, just send an email, go to Stuart and find out about this. We have monthly meetings. We have an annual sun, uh, uh, annual meeting coming up in September. We go hackathons, you can come and visit us. We can send our postdocs and visit you. And this is the number of papers that I have related to this. And I'm gonna stop here and apologies for taking so long. Thank you very much. No, that's why I want to try. This is what I came here. I just found out about them and I thought I would like to try this yeah. generative models. Well, it is a challenge. It is, right? I mean, <laughs> it's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is exactly a challenge. Yeah. I'm learning. But there's, uh, there's a bit of a, I mean, last time I talked to people from the PCMW, I said, oh, so. Google is now working on training neural networks to do battle prediction, right? And they do amazing well. Yeah. And they, do, they don't use generative models, they have a different kind of architecture. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Sorry, if, I, if I'm trying to simplify it, what's your have learned? 
I was hoping that's what I'm not, I'm not learning for, 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 for measure position. How do I correct uh, is uh, the solution that I get from the CD because the core is CD. Is that, a, is that right? Okay, so, so it's a good question. So you shouldn't think in terms of what, you know, the fact that you add this stochastic term, it does not mean that when you run the equation on the course grid, you get closer to the projection of the equation from the fine grid on the course grid. There's no, there's no pathwise improvement. You, know, you don't get closer. All you want to do is to try to describe the distribution of the sinus dot scale. That, that's all you want to do. You, you, want, you want to get, when, when, I, when I do my filtering problem in here, I need this K, which means I don't care about the actual trajectory. I need the transition camera. I want an approximation of the transition camera. So pathwise, I don't, it doesn't mean that I get closer when I add that sigma. All it means is that I get a, a good, a better estimate of this transition kernel. Because yeah. you see, in, in filtering is something very important happening. The way in which the signal comes into the, in there is weekly through its distribution. The actual trajectory of the signal doesn't matter. Yeah, because there are, there are some efforts in the, I guess, in the channel that we do there. They try to learn the field. They try to learn neural, neural operator, essentially. Um, Solving train it, bring a neural model out of the course and then predict and find you know the new certain things. Yeah, so that's pathwise. Yeah, that's pathwise. That's not that you know that's filtering what? doesn't need this. Filtering is forgiving. You say just give me the transition kernel and I'll give you, I'll give you the estimate. Excellent. Okay. Thank you.